all good. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Suited and Buddha. And we told you we would come with a guest. But before we introduce our guest, to my left we have... Lord Mahazi. To my right... GD, Gavin. And the man joining us on the couch today... Too many accolades to list, man. Liga, league, duh. I think that's how you pronounce it. League one, yeah, league one. Over 300 appearances in France. A-league champion. Tunisian international. Let's get a round of applause for Mr. Fahid Ben Kalfala. <laughs> how you going, Fahid? Thanks, man. Going Thanks good? Having you. Yeah, all good, man. Good, good. First question I have is, Rash tells me, I'm really close with Fahid. I said, what? And he goes, what do you mean, what? We're teammates. And I said, if there was two Melbourne victory players that I thought would not be close, <laughs> just based off me being a fan, it's Rashid Mahazi and Fahid Ben Kalfala. I am a, I am a victory fan. Back in the day when you guys were playing, was, I was more diehard. I was at every game. I'm watching the post-game interviews. I'm seeing your personalities. I don't know you personally, but I feel like, okay, I know how, I feel like I know how Fahid is. I feel like I know how Rashid is. How did you two become so, so close? Wait, can I ask you, what do you think we were like before? Okay, Fahid, seasoned pro. Comes in, does everything to the T, right? <laughs> Are you la he's laughing like you did it. Yeah, Comes yeah, in, yeah. he's played probably at a higher level than everyone at victory. Um, He's come in quite a serious guy on the football pitch. You don't really talk much. Laid back. Play your guitar. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, bro. Acoustic you know, songs. True. Yeah, acoustic songs. Oh, yeah. Don't, well, don't get me wrong. Yeah, we were close, but he's not. He's not often coming with me to the acoustic bar. No, he's yeah, just I, abusing I, me about me going to the acoustic I actually, bar. I, I actually tried, but nah. <laughs> you tried it once. I tried. Yeah. Where did you take him? But that's true. We are very different in that no, way. In, in that way, we're very we different. But um, so talk. Okay, so say the first day you meet, and then go from there. We'll yeah. go with you, Rash, first. What What was your first impressions, and and did you think that you'd be rooming with the guy? For well, at the start, he didn't speak any English when he first came. Oh, really? I think one of the first times we were started to hang out, I think, was when we were doing stuff on the bike because we were next yeah, to each other on next the bike. Um, if we were doing like in the gym, if we were doing recovery or something on the bikes and you would just sit there and obviously you got probably 15 minutes to talk yeah. and he didn't speak English at that time. So I tried to teach it, help him learn English, oh, which okay. actually proved a very difficult task in the sense of, I realized how much I don't understand about the English language. <laughs> you know, people ask you questions. Why do you say, ah, instead of an, in this situation? Oh, you know, like, English is the stupidest know, language. Right? All right. Yeah. So that was hard, but... In fairness to him, I reckon he learnt fluent English in probably three months. I was like three months. It was it was it was for some people quite annoying because he started being able to abuse them a bit more <laughs> <laughs> and making it clear what How he meant you really so quickly. quickly. <laughs> to, to be honest, because of him and with so we were Daniel Georgeski, Jason Guerrier, yep. and Rush myself. We were like very close. Yep, but. When you obviously coming to a new country, you have to learn. Yep. It's just a, it's just about respect. And also, <laughs> like you said, when you're on the pitch and you want to say something stupid, dumb, you want to abuse someone or whatever, <laughs> you have to learn. Yeah. But the way we started was we went to, I think it was Sydney, a game, whatever. And I was supposed to be with someone else in the room. And Rush came was like, oh, like he didn't want to be with that guy. And he was like, oh, you... You want to come with me? And I was like, yeah, just come. Swap with swap with him. And actually, really? we swapped. We ended up just being together. And I was with Matthew Del Pia back then in the room, yeah. but he, would, he was injured. And then when he, come, when he came back, I was like, look, it's probably better anyway for us so you can learn English, I can learn yeah. English. Because that's, a, to be honest, for me, I was, it was very important. Yeah. And that's what we... And we just became very, very close. And then we were just together. And he actually helped me to learn English a lot. I think so. a lot of players maybe struggle with adapting to other leagues if they don't learn the language. Unless you are an absolute superstar. Like I know Carlos Tevez or Aguero, their English sucks. But they're yeah. so good that they don't, it doesn't matter. I think it helps you so much, man. But it helps you, bro, it helps you in every aspect of life. Go on and get milk. Yeah. yeah. Like, you know, outside of the football pitch, meetings, meeting people, even trying to find 
you know, misses, yeah. whatever. Yeah, feeling comfortable yeah, just in that country. With people. But even to be honest, for me, it was I like talking. Yeah. But even on the pitch, like anything we're gonna do, I have to joke. If someone fucks it up, <laughs> then I, I mean, I have to to say something. I cannot just uh and if you're on the abuse, like he said, but like in a good way, you know, laugh everything. You have to. And then he helped me, Jason. Danny was swearing. <laughs> well, <laughs> George just he was like, I can see that. Danny was just like, <laughs> and the worst thing is like when you learn that way, that's how you speak. The problem is like when of you course, go to yeah. school yeah. and everything <laughs> to talk to kids. And so there's a certain way you speak. But then for me, it was like a younger brother. Yeah. Then that's how. That's how I see Rush. Like I see him as a, one of my younger brother yep. because obviously we got very close and different generation probably. Yep. But outside, like for me, on the field, I had to be very professional. But off the field, I like going restaurant, going out, like, you know, every now yeah. and then, like you want to have a laugh. I didn't care. I wasn't like, you know, just oh, he's he's got experience. He's going to stay at home. Like, you know, no, nah, man, I, I was wanted to say, enjoy it. I was sorry to cut you off, but I, I was going to say that when he goes, sees a professional, do everything right. I was actually talking to someone the other day and he was, he was, to be fair to him, he is a very, he does do everything right, right, right in yeah. terms of doing the right things for him, but he doesn't drink. Mm -hmm. So the idea of going out is very different for him because mm. he's going out and it's just like, oh, a few hours later than you would go to bed. Yep. It's not like he's going out and getting smashed, right? Yeah. So we would sit at games, at dinner. We'd, we'd finish the game, away game, and we'd sit in the in the lobby, whatever, everyone would have dinner and then Muskie would get up. This is maybe every second away trip. Not yeah. every time, but every second away trip, he would go, um, all right, guys, you know, well done tonight, Over, Got a big game next week. Just stay in. Just make sure you go to bed early. Do the right things, blah, blah, blah. Soon as we would get into the room, he'd close the door and he'd go, okay, bro, where are we going? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, I think, I think a lot of footballers are similar to Fahid in the sense that they do still love living life. You don't yeah. have to drink. Nah, but that's the thing because for me, it's like the whole week or like, you know, when you train, I will never go out, for example, if I have training the following day. Um, yeah. As soon as I finish training, we can go for lunch or whatever, but then I go home, I do my own things. That's the kind of thing during the week. And But after the game, if you have two days off or whatever, I think it's stupid to tell player, don't enjoy it. If you because if you win, you know you can you can be happy, you can celebrate. But there's a way to yeah. celebrate. Like he said, I don't drink. It's just because I might glass, I might get a glass or whatever. But I don't like it, so I don't get smashed. So for me, it's just like like he said, I can go out, have a, one or two drinks or whatever, and then I'll be home or you know I'll be back at the hotel. Yeah. So, but some people obviously that just go there, get smashed, they come back at like six seven a.m. Then like yeah, it's not doing the right thing. But that's that's for me. You also have to enjoy it off the field because. The first year we had an amazing team. Like, oh. but in, in terms of atmosphere within the team, that was the best thing to me. It's like, oh, everyone, like, we were very happy to be together. Like after training, going for lunch, uh, at night dinner together. Like after the game, celebrating together. So you become very close, and then you play with friends. You don't play. It's not just a teammate. Yeah. It's he's a, he becomes a friend. So when the guy makes a mistake, when people say, oh, it's easier. No, it is. It is easier to play with someone you like. On my side, I was playing with Danny Georgieski behind me. Yeah. So yeah. we were very close friends. So when the guy, for example, if he made a mistake, you want to try to help him yeah. and you help each other. If I went on the other side, I was Jason Guerrier and Jason was playing with Costa back then. So what they were very close very as close. well. So it makes it easier when you play with just someone like you don't care. And that's why to many people said, man, the first year, yeah, we had the best team. Like no doubt we had of the course. best team, the best players, everything. But the atmosphere yeah. within the, the team and within the club was seriously one of the best atmosphere I've seen in my life. And I, th and I think that this is something that especially fans don't understand when a player gets seen out drinking or doing something like that. And everyone's always like, oh, you can't go out. You, can't, you have to go to bed at the right times, meditate, do, you know, cross your D T's, dot your I's. Mm. It's not as simple as that oh. because it's like, okay, if you're doing everything to the perfect how upset i was like that right yeah i, do, oh, I don't want to go out i'm scared oh, i should be doing the right thing i'm meditating in the room doing all this shit that it's like i'm never i'm not relaxing i'm not enjoying my life i'm not relaxed i'm not able to if i have a bad game i go with my friends and talk and forget about it and move on it's like it's it's more complex than just i oh, do everything perfect by the book like you said 
then you have a changing rooms of mates. If you go out one, every now and then and you enjoy life together, it's like, okay, now you're playing with your mates. You enjoy going to training because you go into the changing rooms, you have a laugh, you love these boys instead of just it's work, right? So that's where it becomes a little bit more complicated. Well, I, I've got a question too yeah, for Rashid and, and Faid. <clears throat> you were saying that obviously you you boys were playing in teams that were basically all friends, right? And you're yourself, Faid, as you've been a coach before, you're now an agent, you've obviously played football yourself. Same with you, Rash. How do you think you build that within the team? Because I've been part of, of teams course. that have that family, like I had last year with Avondale, and then I've been in other teams where, like you said, if you don't really like your teammate, sometimes inside you, you're like, I just let it slide. Whereas if you have a player behind you and you're like, he's my real mate, no matter what, if he makes a mistake, you're going to chase after the ball and you're going to try and win it. How do you think you build that within the group? I think, look, it, it comes from the club, yep. coaches, in yep. terms of culture, the so when you sign for a new club, how it is, like, you know, also players who've been there who, I don't know if, if Rash was at the club for a couple of years, but you had players there they played for the club for like, I don't know, six, seven, eight years. Yeah. It it comes from everyone. Yeah. Uh, winning helps. Yeah. I can tell you straight <laughs> away. If you lose, it makes it hard. Because always when you go to sign for a new club, you never really know mm. where you're putting yourself but into. But training camp, you know? you know, when you have training camp and it's one thing usually players don't like going yeah. away, but it creates something. If you have coaches smart enough to say, okay, we're going to go there and work, but we need to create. That's how it yes. starts. And if you have people say, okay, let's organize a dinner. Let's do this and that. Because for me, and I now I have players I look after, the first thing I tell them, be happy. Yeah. Enjoy playing football, but be happy in your life. It yeah. means if you have, you know, sometimes it's good to switch off. Yeah. When you have two days off, man, go see your parents, of your course. family, your friends, yeah. have a drink sometime. There is a right time to do it. And if you play every three days, just focus on football, but be happy in your life. And if you're happy there, you go training the following the, the morning, you go there with a smile. Yeah. Like where instead of going there, soaking, being upset, you ha you start getting into arguments with people. What you yeah, you're course. getting paid. Your job is to play soccer. And I always said, seriously, I, I don't have a lot of regrets, but it's one of the things sometimes I said, I wish I could have enjoyed it more. Yes. I wish I could have done that. You know, sometimes like you go, you argue, you have arguments with people. It's not even worth it yeah. because you're playing soccer. Like you yeah. train in the morning. Okay, in Europe, you train more everything. But here, you know, basically, you have one training in the morning. You go back home and that's it. And then you play games. And sometimes you play in front of 20,000, 30,000. And you say, oh, fuck, man, I wish, uh, you know, yeah. I did things differently. And that's a kind of thing to Venice for me. Yeah. Do, you, do you have any... Sorry, Rash, were you going to say something? I was just going to say from from a, from a younger player in that dressing room, the, I think the culture was set by the key people in the dressing room. So obviously we had Musket. The, the head coach is obviously really important. But then we had JP Anth Kriya, who was the strength conditioning coach yep. and the assistant coach. <clears throat> and they would come into the dressing rooms. They would have a laugh with us. We, we would do things outside of... Like if it was a walk in the in the daytime before we'd go to play games, sometimes they'd come with us, and there was a close relationship there. And it was never like it was never, oh, a relationship where you now um, don't hold each other to high standards. Oh, because we're mates, I'm not going to no, yell at them. Of course, they not. would absolutely smash yeah. us if we did the wrong thing or if we weren't working. But because hard or they're whatever. your mate, but because they're, they're our mate. But then in the chain, obviously, then you have key players that set a standard. And at that time, we probably had him that came in that was a very key personality in the dressing room. Yep. You had a captain, Carl Valeri. You had Bess, which was the other side, maybe the more serious side. <laughs> but then you had Arch that was the, uh, the other side that's more jovial. Like you yeah. had these key personalities all through the squad. And then you had the complimentary young players that are just bringing in the stories, the young stories that the old boys can live vicariously through. Yeah. Do you know how crazy so it's just it is? It's like a perfect dynamic. To have Bess, Archie, Fahid, and Costa yeah, yeah, as your attackers yeah. or, up, or, you know, in the attacking third. That's, that was a good team, man. No, they had what? They James Troisi, Guy Finkler. <laughs> that was after. That, but, was that but after? The, but the, yeah, the first year we had. So Millsy? For me, yeah, Millsy was a captain, but he was quiet. He was Millsy was quiet, like you know, it was a oh, quiet when we captain. Oh, won the league, he yeah, was captain. He hey, was a captain, Carl. Carl was a vice captain. Yeah, so, true. but you had, for me, you had Matthew Del Pierre. Yep. was key on the pitch but 
on off the field, he was like someone like you know you can talk to him very if, calm, if very serious but very <laughs> calm. Like you know you could laugh with him, but the way people looked at him was like oh he's very serious. Like you know, but he was someone like coming training. But straight away after, like you know, you can laugh with him. Is this Milligan? You had, he, you no, had Carl. No, no, oh, that's Del Pierre. Yeah. Carl Valeri was important for me as a foreigner coming. Yeah, he was very, very important because he was kind of like the soccer roos coming back from overseas as well. So he understood the way we saw football. Yeah, because when it's coming, because coming from Austra coming from Europe and from France, there's football and there's your Aussie football. Yes, and sure. when you come here, there's a lot of things you don't understand because they, they do things differently. Yeah. And so he was trying, obviously, because sometimes with Matthew, we were getting upset, like about training and this and that and things. And sometimes he's like, and he was, he tried to explain to us. Carl was amazing for that because seriously for us, he was like, he could relate messages to the staff. Uh, even for us, like we couldn't speak French, English at the beginning, so it's hard. But for that, he was good. You had Archie who was, the biggest star in terms of name, we didn't know him, but when we came, like, you know, you see him joking around, laughing, coming, like always happy, always laughing with a smile. And the name people, like, you know, you look at him and he was by far the biggest star in A-League in terms of name and the way you go away, people knew him at Victory, people loved him. Um, but he was kind of like very cool and very relaxed. Yep. And then you had, like he said, look, best had his personality. He wanted to win, that kind of thing, people. But I was like, man, we came from Europe. My staff, Mathieu, everything, we all wanted to win. So everyone, people say, oh, he's a winner and this and that. People, we all wanted to win. But best brought that kind of stuff probably within the club as well. Uh, you had the young players. Danny Dorjeski coming back from Europe was kind of like a clown, to be honest. Like, you know, <laughs> but he's in a good way. the same Archie but, type feel to the dressing but, room. But the thing yeah. is, Danny was amazing between, he was kind of like in between us, experienced players. Yeah and then young player. So he was perfect because he was a guy like, you know, you always argue with Danny. Like he's a guy like you always, always argue with him. But the, and then you had like other experienced players, like players quiet, a bit quiet, but he was seriously, the, 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 the atmosphere was perfect. Yeah, in like hindsight, so, I don't balance. think you could have got yeah. a more perfect balance. Seriously, the balance was like, you had people like Guy Finkler who was very quiet, such a nice person, but like, didn't talk too much, everything. You can't have like 10 players like Danny oh. Jozieski, no. or you can't have 10 players <laughs> like me yeah. in your training rooms. You can't have 10 players like Rush yeah. or whatever because everyone was different. <laughs> be now, because Venice, the and everyone was bringing something to the training rooms, even players who didn't play a lot, yeah. you know, they brought that thing. And obviously, I think the club with Musky, he was very important there. Like, you know, obviously being a legend of the club as a player, then he took the team. It wasn't easy because he was a new coach. Then JP was very important. I think as an assistant coach, he was very, very good. Uh, Anthony Crea, the, the same. Like The staff was really good. Even and the office. In the office. That was amazing. Yeah. The people in the, within the office, that was great, to be honest. Like, you know, you could feel like, I don't know now, to be honest, I don't, I'm not there, whatever, like, you know, yeah. a daily basis, but there's a, you could have, you knew, like there was leadership, everything, and you, everyone knew his role, so which was good. Um, but the first, yeah, yeah, it was, it, to be honest, it was great. And then, every, every club says, oh, it's like a family. No, nah, it was. It Most clubs was. is not like that. Well, the Most way, clubs are not like a family. Can I just be honest here? I just want to be honest. Like, I've been a lifelong Victory fan, and, you know, I have my thoughts on the A-League about what they could fix or whatever. I'm going to be real here. The way you guys are describing it sounds like, on a smaller scale, how it was during Fergie's era at United, where it's like every single person at the club added something yeah. with their yeah. own personality, with their own skill set. And I just didn't think it would be to that level that you're describing for Melbourne Victory, but I guess it showed on the pitch. Yeah. No, it was. and But I remember even just out, like in the following Christmas, like there's a lot of people came to my place like to celebrate Christmas mm. like with my daughter everything mm. I, don't, I can't remember how many players but it's just like you know we used to do things off the field yeah. Yeah. so it's so important people say it's on the field now it's off the field as well there's a lot of things but the club is responsible for that you know because I think after just a couple of weeks the club organised us like um, 
It was like a barbecue, something, a family time, like, you know, uh, yeah. something with the families. That's right. I, I think I was, I came, uh, it was my second week. I forgot And so we went to St. Kilda. We That's had right. barbecue there. Like, so for me, it was new, yeah. but you could see, like, players with their kids, a family. So I was great. And then we, a month later, we had, like, a, something, an opening for the family as well. So that was, that was true, to be honest. My daughter never, sp she was with me on the pitch after every game. Yeah. She was in the channel room with me after and every all game. The, all of the kids. So yeah, and that's yeah. that's Everyone's, one of the yeah. thing. And then because you're happy, you want to give back to people. You know, mm. that help you to make you happy. So um, I'm well, not saying like you're gonna win every time, but it helps. Of course, I, yeah. I tell you a story to 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 highlight the differences of personalities. Right, <laughs> we came in after um, a loss. I can't remember which team we lost to, but we lost. And um, we'd gone into, and I wonder now, even in hindsight, I wonder if Muskie did this deliberately, but like we went into the video room. Do you remember this? And he didn't come in for a while. So we were sitting in there for a while. I know where you're, and, I know where you're going. Yeah. I, I won't going. say the players' names, but basically a couple of players are having a laugh. Not, not having a laugh. Look, we've lost on the Saturday. It's now Monday. <laughs> so kind of talking, a little bit of giggling, whatever. And a player turns around and goes, Hey, can you shut the fuck up? I'm fucking pissed off here because we fucking lost. And then we sort of just went silent for a little while. And then one of the other bigger players goes, Hey, if I want to have a fucking laugh, I'm going to have a fucking laugh. <laughs> and that was like the dynamics, the differences of personality. I already know who said the first one. I'm not going to, yeah. I don't want to go too much into the story because yeah. then I'm going to have to say the people's names. Yeah. But, you know. Um, that just highlights the differences of personality, but the 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 way that it's driving seriousness and and commitment to win and all the professionalism, but then also like enjoying our time at the club, and it's like both forces pushing, you know. <laughs> That's, I'm sorry, I know exactly who it is. We won't go into it. I know exactly who it is. It's okay because you put on an accent. Um, so, <laughs> but I do want to say. Um, Back to Fahid's point about you wanted to have more fun or, you know, enjoy yourself more. Do you have one main regret with your career in terms of that? In France, back, it's different because you actually have proper pressure. Yeah. Coming from the fans where there's after games, for example, like you lose, you can't walk out or you have to wait or cops have to, there's games like, you know, in Bordeaux, like it's a massive club in France. And we were losing at home or something. We had to go to the hotel, to go back to the hotel because we, the fans didn't let us leave the stadium. So we had the cops, everything coming, blah, blah. So we had to go straight away to the hotel. And then you can't do anything. So when I played for Tunisia, you lose a game and it's like you're going to end up going to, like you're going to go to jail. And if you win, like you can do whatever you want. So... In Europe, you play and you play with pressure. There's relegation, there's promotion. Mm -hmm. When you get relegated, people lose their job, yep. and you lose money, uh, whatever, fifty percent of your salary, everything. So there's a lot of things, but despite that, you should always try to enjoy it. And sometimes, like when I, that's the kind of thing. Sometimes I was like, if I knew, to be honest, like you know, okay, we lost, but still like you know i'm gonna go back tomorrow and i have to enjoy it more so sometimes like you lose and for like three days or four days you go at training and everyone is sulking and everyone people are not happy yeah. that's probably the thing when i came here obviously it's different level is not the same so i kind of like enjoy it more than ever yeah, especially in my first year to be honest I, and I, mean, I mean like more of the field yeah of course things i could do with my daughter going back to the going to the beach with my daughter Something I couldn't do, yeah, I couldn't yeah. do when I was in France. Oh, when I, pl I, I never took my daughter to Tunisia because as a player for the national team there, like you're a superstar or whatever, and there's things you can't do, like, you know, as a tourist. So people don't realize, hey, because here, if you play with a soccer roost, you go to, mm. to the shop, no one knows who you are anyway, mm. except maybe like the two or three biggest name. Yep. So that's very different. You play for victory, even if it, it is a big club, and no one knows you. Like, you know, you can have a normal life. So that's where, wow. like, the difference is there for me. Uh, then, except that, no, nah, look, to be honest, I'm happy with what I've done. Um, I think it's more my, my second year of victory. Like, to be honest, if I had to change something, mm. I think uh, the atmosphere we had the first year, the second year was very different. Okay. Uh, I think also, 
like yeah, a couple of stuff within the club, everything. Um, yeah. Can you tell us about that second year? What ended up happening the, towards the end of your contract? Was that second year? Uh, third year. I was third year. Third year. You know what? Because from my perspective, I don't know if I ever told you this, but I always thought that that was um, – he'll, he'll give you the context, but I always thought that was pretty admirable or um, – yeah, I always looked up to you a lot for the way you handled that situation. It was probably a little bit of a difficult situation to navigate, particularly because you were coming off contract. There was talk of somewhat trying to get you to leave, correct? Yeah. Yeah. You were handling it. You were de- dealing with it behind closed doors yourself. Yeah. Not, it wasn't your agent, right? No, you myself. were doing it yourself. And then also like having the courage to do that and then also having to play on the weekend and and prove what you're saying on the weekend. I guess this is why he's a good agent now. But like that that was always – I was very – I admired you a lot for that period because I always thought you have to have a lot of courage to um, to put all the responsibility on your, your contract, take it all yourself, not give it to an agent, but then also like fight for yourself behind closed doors, but then also have to play on the weekend, you know? Can you tell but, us about that? Yeah, period? well, I had a trigger on my contract and I can't remember how many games I had to play to get another year. And obviously I was playing, but then the third year was just weird sometimes. Like, you know, you see things. And to be honest, I was like, okay, I'm not an arrogant person, but I know what kind of players I was in A-League. So... At one point, like I was, I started seeing things, and I was like, "Ah, man, okay, I've been in football for a long time, and I and I ha- I know the feeling, and I know what's gonna happen now because I had the feeling the club or coaches or whatever people didn't want me, so I was like, okay, they're gonna do everything on purpose for me not to get the trigger to hit the trigger, and straight away at the beginning of the season, I was like, okay, one of player was sometime was playing in front of me, I was like, ah, oh, man. Okay, there's things like you can, we can argue, you can say, okay, it might be different. Everyone is entitled to his opinion. But I was like, yeah, now there's no way he's better than me. <laughs> I was like, nah, now there's no way he's we better than me. We knew his fans, don't worry. And, we knew. And so at one point I was playing, and to be honest, I was doing well. And all of a sudden, don't know why, we're going to Newcastle, and I'm, off the, I'm on the bench. The team is struggling, and I don't even come on. And like he's putting young players in front of me, and I was like, nah. Okay, now it gets to a point where I'm pissed, but it's getting ridiculous. So I was like, it doesn't even touch me, yeah, because it, it's it's just ridiculous. And that game, I remember the assistant coach came to me and he apologized to me. He's like, I'm sorry to what's happening. Anyway, during the weekend, I go back home, get a phone call from the club, like on Monday. That we had a day off, and he was like, oh, I've got to talk to you. Like you know, I didn't go. Like I'm not going. I was like, oh, what the fuck, I'm not going. So the following day, I go to training, and the well, coach wants to talk to me. Like, yeah, there's no point, nothing to talk about. Yeah, but I need to talk. I said, there's nothing to talk about. Like, you're actually the coach. Do whatever you want. And But I, to be honest, it was like, there's no point. The discussion we're going to have is, for me, pointless. Yeah. Because you're going to try to explain to me, maybe if you, there is a reason. First of all, you're the coach. You don't, if you don't want to explain your choices, I always tell players, if the coach doesn't want to explain something to you, doesn't ha- he's the boss. If you're not happy, leave the club or whatever. I didn't ask for any explanations, but it's like, you're going to explain to me he's better than me? Well, now being honest, not being arrogant, even at 50%, I still, I'm still better than him. So <laughs> that's now I know that. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, trying obviously to ask me to get rid of the trigger to then I can play. That's fine. Don't play me. I signed a contract. You don't want to play me, you don't want to play me. So what is for, for the people? So that that's why I didn't play a couple of two or three games. I didn't play and I was and the thing what I didn't like, it's one game I never said anything publicly. Never talked about it because for me it didn't matter. I was like, that's me. The only thing that pissed me off, really, really pissed me off is that my daughter was really sad, not seeing me playing football. She was like, because I was actually thinking of getting retired that year. Yeah. But I was like, I always said one thing in my life. No one is going to make a decision for me. Mm-hmm. If I make a decision, it's me. No one is going to push me to get retired on this on that. And I always said, I know what I've done in my career. I know what I was, if I was good or not good or something, I was smart enough to know that. But I've done, uh, like I played or whatever, and no one's going to force me to do anything. And I didn't play. At one point, I was out of the squad. 
But when it came out, obviously, I knew it wasn't good for the club. Not on me. You, you can try to explain how oh, yeah, I'm making other choices. People knew. Like, no disrespect to two or three players playing in where they were playing. Well, even to be honest, like, even with a moon boot, I would have been better some, <laughs> some numbers than. Nah, no disrespect. No, but to be honest, I was just better. So then it's to try to explain that. Okay, fine. You don't want me? Tell me at the end of my contract, Fade, I don't want you. And it's fine. And because I was like 34, whatever, I would leave. I'm not here to take money or something or for one year, whatever. You think I, I want to stay somewhere if you don't want me? I've done my career. Like, mm, it's behind me. Like, it's just like I'm going to play one or two more years or whatever. Like, that's the kind of thing that re I, w I was really pissed. But in the same time, I was training. Didn't want to show anything to anyone. Mm. That was my my issue or with the coach or with the club or whatever. And it's it's that's probably to be honest, you know, when, I, when you ask me the regret, that is a regret because the club at that point didn't do the right thing. And that I say I said it, the club did, did definitely didn't do the right thing. But what's the regret? I should I should have stopped playing for victory at that point. Myself, I should have made a I'm not playing anymore for the club. I should have I should have stopped but don't you before the finals, everything, and I should have said I should have stand to that because at the beginning I was like no. I'm not gonna play. That's fine. If you don't want to play me, don't play me. But then it got to a point where actually fans were asking me, my daughter, everything. But I should have said, you know what? You want to stick to that decision? I'm not playing anymore for victory. But don't you think it was more powerful the way that it ended up? Because I remember there was a certain game where you came off the bench and you. No, but scored actually the following game when so we went to Sydney, whatever. But then we played against Perth at home. And I started. And I scored. <laughs> and we won one year. <laughs> and so that, but it's, for me, to be honest, like we thinking about it, I should have said, yeah, that's fine. I don't want to play. You don't play me, but you know what? That's it. It's over. And, uh, and it would have been like, yeah, I should have stand to that. So what was the trigger, for the people that don't know, what was the trigger in I, the I had to play a certain amount, of, to start a certain amount of games. I can't remember, to be honest. Um, for them to re-sign you? To, to have a, yeah, an automatic extension. Automatic extension. And then, like, yeah, whatever we spoke. But to be honest, then when the club started doing that, for me, I knew I wasn't going to stay anyway. Yeah. To be honest, like, I don't want to stay. If you don't want me, for any reason, you can explain, look, I want to go somewhere else. I want to do this. I want to have another player. That's fine. I'm not 23 years old. You know what? I came from France, everything. I played at a certain level. We can have a discussion face-to-face. And that's fine. And that it's going to be very simple. When I left Brisbane, I went to see John Aloisi. And uh, after one year, to be honest, after a couple of months, I had the feeling where I had enough. Yeah. I went to see John and I was like, look, to be honest, I know I can still play easily in this league. But I also know I'm not the same player as I used to be. Mm -hmm. I'm not the same kind of player I used to be. But yeah, I can be fine. But I know you can go and probably find someone else. And I'm not going to enjoy it. And I didn't say anything. He was the only one. Him and his brother knew it. My wife, my daughter. No one knew I was going to stop getting, getting retired. And just the last game of the season, people found out because I didn't want to make a big story of it. I didn't care. Like, you know, I didn't want people to say, oh, he's going to stop everything. That's fine. It's my decision. I, I, from my perspective, I remember this period. And... Um, the fans were wondering what the fuck was going on um, with you not playing because of how good you were, especially in that first first season. You showed really what was <laughs> what what you were about. But I think I got to commend you and Rash said as well for how you dealt with it because a lot of other players, especially now, would come out and make a fuss in the media and try to get people on their side, try to get fans on their side. The fact that you just Kept that under wraps, kept a professional is something that I think a lot of footballers can can learn from because a lot go the opposite way. But the only thing is like that game, there's a game at home. I wasn't in a squad. Well, obviously for that reason. But then they put me as a injured player. Like the reason why was like he's injured. I was like, oh. nah, man. I was like, nah, that's yeah. fine. Do whatever you want, but don't lie. For me, there is one thing. Do not lie. For sure. And yeah. I remember, like, people were asking me, I was like, are you injured? So I'm not. And pe so people asked me, so oh, what's the reason? I said, look, do your research. Ask questions. I'm not going to say anything. I don't talk to media, everything, to be honest, yeah. that kind of stuff. 
but to ask, I'm not injured. That's the only thing I can tell you. I'm not injured. I can play. So and, we're a lot and then of obviously people are asking questions. And then it came out apparently, I don't have social media. So I was in the stand. I can't remember which game it was, but they put my face on the screen. And then apparently on social, I was with my friend. So actually he's a current sports director of Reims in France. He was in Australia. He was with me. And he's got social media and he showed me and people were saying, oh, is he injured, not injured, everything. And that's and people say, no, nah, he's not injured. And I don't know, obviously, how after what happened exactly. But I remember we won the game, <laughs> we walked in the changing rooms and looking at some faces from people like the board, the coaches, they were like, how are we going to deal with this shit? Like that, because the first question is going to be asked is, okay, what's the, what's the situation oh. with him? <laughs> and I remember what, walking in the changing room, we're like, Carl came to me, was like, oh, it's going to be funny now. Because Carl was like, Carl came to me and asked me, he said, Fai, like, we need you to play everything. I said, go see the coach, man. Like, <laughs> it's not me. I have nothing to do with that. So, and players sometimes ask me, what, what's going on? Fai yeah. was close to me or whatever, but that's for me, it's a situation I have to deal with. So no one else. You uh, can't jeopardize anything or whatever, you know. What, what, would you, what advice do you give to your players now? That's Obviously, you're now an say, agent. Yeah. That when they're in that situation, if a coach doesn't want them or a coach doesn't like them, what are you telling your players? Work, work hard. The only thing you can do, sometimes I'll say, if you really want an answer, there's nothing better than go to the coach, ask him, to be honest with you. Mm. He might tell you he doesn't like you. He might tell you you're not good enough. That's fine. The only thing you can do is like be professional, work hard. When I, I was in Bordeaux for my last six months, the coach didn't play me. And we ha I had a massive argument with the assistant coach one day at training. Something happened, everything. From that moment, I never played. For six months, didn't play one game. And the coach made it very clear to people at the club, we, I can have 20 players injured or whatever, I will play anyone else before him. So I never, never went to the coach, never asked him any explanation. Because for me, he's a boss, he's a coach. I don't have to ask him. He doesn't have to explain to me. If I'm not happy, I can leave. In January, I left the club and I went to see goodbye. I went to see him and say goodbye to him. I shook his hand and I said, the only thing that's the time I said, I never understood because you, I'm quite sure you didn't know what exactly what happened. He said, oh, you should have, you should have come to me. Mm -hmm. I said, and I, I said, no, you should have come to me. Yeah. You as a coach, I don't have to, whatever. That's fine for me. But that's, that was my philosophy. Coach doesn't want to play you. The only thing you can do is just to work hard. Don't complain. Don't whinge. And you, at one point, if you're not happy, then try to go somewhere else. But the prime is now today, the majority of the players, as soon as I don't play two months, three months, I want to leave. And I cannot stand that. Yep, that's and I cannot about. stand that kind of stuff. I get upset with my, my players every time. You don't play. What about you shut up? And what about you try to work hard? <laughs> and because, because that is, for me, it's just about a mentality thing. Stop being a quitter. You don't give up. And you try to make it work. And if it doesn't work after a year and a half and two years, okay, at the end of the season, we can go have a discussion, for example, with the club and the coach. What do you think? Maybe now, you know what? Maybe, okay, maybe we can move on and leave. But fight. Fight for your job or whatever. But the prime is like now, as soon as you don't play three months, four months, six months, yeah, I'm not happy, I want to leave. Yep. And if you don't play here in A-League, where are you going to go anyway? You know, so people, that's the kind of thing. Try to make it, and I, I've got players sometimes, to, to be honest, they don't play for five months or four months or five months, but they keep working, and all of a sudden, uh, it's weird, but all of a sudden you start playing. And yeah. then, I can't play for you, man. So when you're on the pitch, you're the one who's gotta have to perform. And people say, oh, you know the worst thing for me, it's like when, I, when people use the word politic. Yes. Mm. I, I always uh. say, I have never seen a coach, especially in A-League, where there's no pressure, yeah. because there's no relegation promotion. I've never seen a coach here who's going to stop a 16, 17, 18, 19 years old to play if he deserves to play. Yeah, because is a, every, coach is, every coach is will want to be the first one to play that kid. Because as a coach, it's, it's going to make you proud and you're going to start his career, whatever. And a lot of people said, oh, 19, ah, it's this politics. You know, no, it's no fucking politics, man, in A-League. <laughs> yeah. You need to stop that. People need to stop thinking that. If he doesn't play you, it's because the coach thinks you're not good enough. Yeah. Or you don't suit his system. Or he's got someone else better than him. But then it's fine. Sometimes 
then it's a discussion. You can stay there. And you see, I'm not saying all the coaches are great or whatever, but you can have a coach who's going to be maybe a dickhead. Yeah. And for like a year, and you see like, yeah, okay, there's weird thing. Some, some, something is weird. Then, okay, I'll yeah. go to the club and have a discussion with them, everything. You can tell the young player, keep working, keep working. And then at the end of the season, we'll try to make it work. But when you sign a contract, no one forced you to sign a contract. No one put a gun on your head to sign a contract. So you got to try to make it work. And that's, a, for me, the worst thing, not just here now, I think it's all around the world. It's a mentality thing where young players give up quick. You know, it, if it doesn't work six months, they want to change clubs straight away. That's, that's an issue for me here. I think, I think uh, just the last point, that was brilliant for him, by the way. I think the, the last point I want to make on that is um, in Europe, you're right, especially in this day and age, if they don't play for a couple of months, they want to loan. I want to go play. I want to play. I want to play. I want to play. I want to play. But you see it all the time. A player can get frozen out because the coach doesn't think they're good enough or whatever. Their attitude might be bad. And then out of nowhere, they start 10 games in a row. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, you just have to be consistent with it. And that, that is going to be the difference between the ones who go to different heights and the ones that just stay at you know, a, a certain level. And the politics thing is right. Unless, you know, there is politics in state four. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> is that because you're not playing at the moment? I don't, I don't play, but I see the politics in State 4. But the higher you get, you're going to play your best players. Yeah, but, but when you mean this politics is because when you have juniors or whatever, sometimes yeah, you, have, you, yeah. have, you know what, parents you're going to have the president, like the parents is yeah. in the board, yes. and they want their kids. Yeah, exactly. It's true. Yeah, but in A League, yeah. there's no politics. Nah. This is yeah, you, this the, is my and, point. And I agree me. with you, like at NPL and state level, and you do have parents, you know what, involved throwing money, everything, yep. and they have their kids staying, yep. and they will play and everything. A hundred percent, it's yeah. true. Yeah. But in A League, at professional level, no, it's not. Yep. The coaches will always try to play the best team. Now, maybe the coach is not good enough. Maybe he's got a different opinion. Maybe, so, but sometimes there is f things, weird things happening. I'm not saying it's not, yeah. but it's just because the coach thinks differently. My, I'm not saying he's right or wrong. And then you try to make it work because I have players sometimes I don't play. Young players said, keep working, keep working. And we'll see at the end of the year. Sometimes you make a move and you go somewhere and it works perfectly, but you always have to think if it does, if you go somewhere and it doesn't work, what are you going to do after? Yeah. So sometimes people think, oh, yeah, grass is greener there. Not always, but you if you if you keep working for me, it's like work, work, work. And if you're good enough in A League, you're gonna make it. Well, if you like you said, if you have that mentality and it doesn't go your way, at least you will leave it thinking, you know what? I tried everything. I tried my best. I was always I was always good in training. I was always respectful to everyone at the club. But if you don't do that, then you might leave with some regrets thinking, ah, I could have worked harder. I shouldn't have left when I did because, you know, this player got injured and then I could have got a spot or whatever. But I, I want to speak quickly on, on France. Now, please pardon my pronunciation of these teams. That's oh, no. right. Amiens. 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 Four years or five? Four. Four years. Angers. No. Amiens. Laval. Angers. Caen. Valenciennes. Bordeaux. Wow. Bro, I don't even know at what point is the syllable like. <laughs> how, how many teams was I, that? I want to. I want to talk about. So I, I did some research. Uh, you were doing uh, quite well at Valenciennes, and then Bordeaux come in. Yeah. What was it like getting there? Because that is a massive club with a massive fan base who have, who apply a lot of pressure to their players, as you've said. How old were you when you got there and what was it like joining a club that big? Where was your head at? I think I was 26. Um, yep. Well, I had a great season at Valenciennes. We were like uh, six or seventh, like in League One. Um, I was top goal scorer in my team, top assist. Wow. And in France, I finished with uh, Lucho Gonzalez. Like he was um, an Argentinian, Argentinian player. We finished like top in terms of assist, like in the whole league. So together. And so I had a very, very good season. And I had a couple of clubs in Cheristy, like, and went to June, played against France just before the World Cup um, with Tunisia. And I had, like, an amazing game. Yep. And clubs, obviously, like, you know, sometimes they, 
there's one thing missing even if you play uh, like at a certain level like you know the whole year yeah. there's still like we need to see I don't know sometimes like you know and there's so much so many players so many top players and so much competition so sometimes it's just like you know one thing I had that game I think that made a lot of difference because and then we were like three or four players like Payet was one of them <laughs> myself like uh, I can't remember so we were like three or four players to be like and only one like um, okay, where yeah, they yeah. were gonna they were gonna pick one player, and the season started and discussion with Bordeaux everything and to be honest when they came the only thing when I knew they wanted me I went to see the coach and I said I'm not playing this weekend I gotta go <laughs> and he was like uh, <laughs> I, I said look and the coach was great Philippe Montagnier like top coach and we kind of had like he played but then I, I played in second division I started in second division. And he was the same, like, you know, coach, he was in third division, second division, and and then he came to first division, and he did really well, and he ended up at, like, Real Sociedad, everything. Yeah. And I went to see him, and I said, coach, being honest, if Bordeaux tomorrow came for you, you would leave. Of course. He said, yeah, discussion. I said, look, I called the president. I said, I'm not staying. I don't <laughs> want to stay. It's just at one point, like, you also have to take responsibility as a player, and clubs have to be smart enough to say, okay, it's a great opportunity for him. The club was making money. I can't remember. They make like five or six million it was euros. Five point something, whatever yeah. million yeah. euro or something. Yeah. So, at night, went back home straight away. My agent called me. and said, "Yeah, all agreed." My wife had an amazing job. My parents-in-law came uh, like home, everything, like to know to have like to spend the weekend or something. And I was like, "Gotta go to the airport." She was like, "What do you mean?" I said, "I gotta go to Paris, sleep there, and tomorrow I've got the medical, everything in Bordeaux." So went there, had a medical. But the thing is like didn't even have time to realize because two days later we had the game against Marseille. And so, uh, and then, so after Marseille, I went with the national team. So straight away. So as everything happened so quick, yeah. but then you realize when I went to Bordeaux and yeah, it's like you sign the club where like Z Zidane played there, Dugarry, Lizarazu, uh, Tigana, like massive names. And you realize the size of the club. And I was like, fuck. Wow. Did, did you ever play with Johan Gokov? No, nah, actually, so he, Johan left. I was the one who replaced him. So right. I got transferred because he left the club. So when it happened, it's like, you don't realize, but then I was like, yeah, I made it like to a big club. But in some, I was like, a, like in, I wasn't a star, it's something in Iguan, but I was a, like, I would say like between a, a good and very good player yeah, in Iguan. So you go there and you said, okay, I know I get, I reached a certain point, but then it's not finished. Like there's better clubs. <laughs> I was going to ask you, did you ever have in your career a moment where you're like, I got to where I wanted to get to? Did you nah. ever have that moment where you're like, No, nah, because it. I think, I think, and I, and I look, it's a good example because I've got young players today and I tell them, for example, like when they struggle, I started at 18 years old in, four, in, in second division. I signed a contract, didn't do any academy. So from amateur, went to second division yeah. and I started playing straight away because Injury, some like some injuries or whatever, and so four years. Then I went to another team in second division. Then the team got relegated, so I ended up in third division and went back to second division. And then after we went to watch a game with my wife, and I was like, I know I'm gonna make it. I know I would be here in first division. I know I'm gonna make it. I've got the quality, but it's just at one point you need to maybe mm. meet the right coach. You know, have someone in your life that can help you. And that's exactly what happened when I signed for Angers. I was like, that year I finished like second best player of the league. Wow. Uh, and then I had clubs, everything in League One coming. And then it was like, yeah, but the coach was amazing with me. He helped me to get to reach a certain level. So it took me seven, seven years, uh, seven years to, to go from second division to first. And I tell players, no disrespect to I said and I was a much better player than you <laughs> <laughs> so, so stop complaining <laughs> no but that's a sweetness and I and I explained so it's, it's struggling is fine not yeah. everyone is Messi and Ronaldo and yeah. Neymar and everything so struggling is part of it it's, there is, it's a journey it's gonna be a long journey sometimes you're gonna struggle sometimes you're gonna have great things and but you need to to work to keep working hard and believe in yourself and if you do that there's no point like to be that I think you can make it. I'm not going to say it's guaranteed, but if you if you have quality, if you work hard, if you are very serious and you believe in yourself, the chance to make it is quite high. Um, and then obviously you need to 
maybe has a good agent, maybe yeah. the right agent, maybe uh, meet the right coach, you know, who's going to believe in you and play you and everything. So there's a lot of things that go there. So, man, <laughs> this is great insight. So when you're at Bordeaux, is there, a, is there a specific moment or a game or a story or something where you just thought, okay, this is the pressure's on now or this is a different... Do you have one story from Bordeaux? First game. First game against Marseille. I think when I... So we're playing at home, my first game, and the team didn't lose at home against Marseille for like 30 years. <laughs> and we're losing halftime 1-0. And I was, that's my first game. And oh I was like, no. man... Wow, we're not gonna lose that game. <laughs> That's so, and but you feel like the, the atmosphere was amazing, and we drew. We didn't lose, but it's just a pressure because my second game, we're going to Nice, and so coming back from national team, when there everything, you come back, and I had like an average game. Yeah. But the coach straight away like, hey, that's where we are. You need to be here. So straight away like didn't accept, like even just doing average, that wasn't good enough. So it's like then you start seeing, okay, at training, the, the competition also at training where you have like, I don't know, 17, 18 international players, Brazil, France, like Argentinian and all that stuff. So from top national team training, the quality was so high. Someone is on the ground injured. No one stops the, game, the ball. Like you play, man. Like you, no one is stopping anything. You, it's hard to make friends at that level because you are just in competition. So you want to play. Mm -hmm. So... It's, for me, it was about training. The, the quality of training was so high, so you needed to, to adapt to that. <laughs> and it took me a couple of weeks to be honest. But even if Valenciennes was like a really good team, it took me a couple of weeks to adapt to that training and getting used to that. And then after, it's fun. Like, you know, you, you get there and you said, oh, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm that kind of player. You know what's funny? I'm just thinking, this guy's played NPL and then he's played A-League <laughs> and then he's played Bordeaux and he's coached. NPL level, you've... Bro, can you give us... What is the difference between NPL, A-League, and then, let's say, Europe, normal level, yeah. and then top-level Europe? <sighs> wow, look, NPL here, it's different. Like, you can't talk about it. Uh, I would say... <laughs> nah, but what I would say is, like, you can't talk about, like, the level is... It's poor, like, really poor. Yeah. A-League is, like, in terms of intensity... Training, players like, you know, one of the things, the craziest thing for me is like Skinfold. You skin go to fold, Skinfold, yeah. you yeah. go to France, European players, they're all skinny. Like, it's, it's just muscles. Like, you know, <laughs> Skinfold is like 25, 30, whatever. Yeah. You get here, you've got players that are 60, whatever, like men. So, sometimes, like, it's, it's embarrassing. And that is, f first of all, the first thing. And then it's about, you train more. The competition is harder. So um, I enjoyed victory because the atmosphere is a crowd. And when you have a big crowd or when you go to a game, you, we, you go to a city game, city versus victory or whatever, a couple of years ago when you have like 50,000 people. Yeah. It's like a game in Germany, like in terms of atmosphere. So it makes it look better. Yes. Take the crowd, <laughs> get rid of <laughs> the crowd and you look at it and say, okay, maybe actually it's not great. Yeah. Um, but it's the same in Europe. You have some bad games. I think it's about consistency. Yes. An A-League player, a good A-League player can play at certain levels. There's really good young players here that can go to Europe. But it's about, okay, we only play 26, 7 games here. You go to Europe, all of a sudden you play like 45 games. So you're playing almost double sometimes. Or you go to England. Like I can, I send, look, Cousini Engi, I took him to Portsmouth. He's playing twice the number of games he played in A-League. So you need to adapt to it. And then it's about being consistent to a certain level where... You're training with better player, but it's also like when you set up a certain standard. At, at Victory, he could tell you, like, we had the GPSs. That was the first time we had, I had G a GPS. <laughs> and I, was looking, <laughs> I looked at my name every time I go there. It's like last second, last third, last. So I was like, man, I had the feeling I was running. And then you had players running. And sometimes <laughs> I, was, I was arguing. I was like, yeah, man, look, leave me alone. Then I was like, yeah, but you, I said, man, leave me alone. Does it tell you how many balls he lost? Because you can be there and run like an idiot all around the pitch or whatever. Okay, you're going to be high there, but at the same time, technically, you're rubbish. Yeah. So I don't care about it. So there is like, you know, a certain thing where in Europe, we're going to look, okay, numbers, high intensity and everything, but at the same time, it's about quality. 
here sometimes we think we look at it like oh we need to run you need to be an athlete well football is about being technical good technically good being smart yes you have like look, some players in the league today i don't know if you guys follow the league you take some tall guy arslan players like him or valer Germain, like obviously they're they're top top players so they're gonna run in a like they're gonna be smart things they're gonna do like they don't they're gonna think they're gonna see things in advance where sometimes an average AD player is just gonna be doing something stupid. Yeah. So it's more about that. And when you reach to a certain level, like it's about, I always said, I got lucky to play against like world-class player. There's a couple of players when I looked at them and I was like, okay, I know they're better. I know they're better. But there's players I played and they were much better in terms of career, like Ribéry, Robin. But when I played against them, I didn't feel they were better. But then it's like about being consistent in 15 years. What I was capable to do of like six months, yes. they do it for six for 15 years. Every game is eight out of 10. Yeah, exactly. Eight out of 10, so eight that's out of 10. A, that is the biggest difference because sometimes I was like, okay, I have the quality. I know I can do well. I can perform here. But it's about keeping that here at that level. And obviously I wasn't capable of doing it because then, yeah, to I was being able to reach a certain club like Bordeaux, but to go to a club like Real Madrid, everything, then you need to be even better. Yeah. Uh, but then you see players like Ibrahimovic. So on that, you played against PSG when they were... Yeah. So Lavezzi, Ibrahimovic. Yeah. But that was about to tell you, Ibrahimovic is one of the players. When I played against him, I was like... <laughs> he's, he's probably on, like, on that level. When you look, said, okay, he's different. Him, like Henri... When and Henry was at the end of his career, but like you can see, like certain players like Anelka, you, you, when you have that feeling, you know, it's uh, man, that's where did you play against Anelka? France, France, uh, Tunisia, Tunisia versus France. So, and he looks like he's not trying, nah, but yes, uh, man, that's but Ronaldinho, when he was so my first year, my second year at Amiens, we played against Paris Saint Germain, we beat them 3 0. They had him, Okocha, Anelka up front. So um, <laughs> and, and it, was a, it was a friendly game and we beat them 3 0. And Ronaldinho, I think that was his second year or something. I can't remember. Because they were just thinking about going out after. No, nah, it's just friendlies. Like <laughs> That's of what season. I mean. So it's like, they were just walking nah, around thinking about it going out. Emotion, man. Like, you know, <laughs> but it, certain players, when you look at them, say, okay, they're doing a different sport. Like they're on a different level. Yeah. I saw uh, Schneider was impressive. For me on the on the but not when you look at him, it's just uh, you can't touch him. He's going around like running around technically, just amazing. And then yeah, it's like but when I look at some players here and I tell them you do have the quality to go to Europe, but then it's being serious, the mentality. Well, how about <laughs> what about how about recently? Obviously, I, this is a, I don't know if I told you this, but basically I put up a TikTok talking about. Oh. Australian players going over to to Europe and that yes. they shouldn't go to such big clubs so quickly end up getting a call about that one. What do you think about what do you think about that kind of thing about players going to massive clubs directly from Australia? I the think Celtics and all, all that all that kind of stuff that we're Manchester uh, City and blah blah blah. I think for me, okay, saying it's a mistake, you'll have to put yourself in that position. So when you're a young player and you get a call from Bayern, Real, everything, it's hard to refuse. Me, my thing is like I tell players, there is a path to go there. If someone thinks when you leave Australia, you're ready to go to a massive club, I think you're wrong. Mm -hmm. I think I, I played at a certain level and there is, you need to go step by step. And Australian level Unfortunately, it's not good enough to go there, and regardless what kind of players. If you're young, maybe they can improve you, whatever, but you need to play and you need to get game time. That is going to be the most important thing. doesn't guarantee anything, even if you go to a smaller club. doesn't guarantee you're going to play. You might struggle as well, but if you know a club, for example, a small club is going to invest whatever, 500, a million, something on you, it means something for a certain club where if you have a club like Barcelona, whatever, coming and spending one million, it means nothing for them. It's like, it doesn't matter. It's more gambling. It's a gamble. It's a gambling on that. Um, 
for me, there is like you have to go. It's better to go to a smaller club. You know, you need to go somewhere where they really want you, but you're gonna get game time. And I always said, it's better when you get respected. Those big clubs at one point, if you go to Europe, they will respect you because they don't respect Australian players. People say, yeah, yeah Australia and this and that. It's bullshit. Yeah. Uh, it's unfortunate, but that is the truth. They don't have enough respect for Australian players. So you need to go there and earn your respect. And going somewhere, if you go to championship, if you go to a club in League Two in France, in Italy in second division, in Spain, or a small club like in first division in Europe, or some countries like Switzerland, yeah. uh, Portugal, everything, small clubs. But when you know you're going to get game time, and from there, if you do play, things go quick in Europe. So as soon as you play and you're young, you can make a bigger step. But if you go to a big club and it doesn't work, yeah, you're going to be loaned out somewhere. But sometimes clubs, they're not interested to have a young players on loan because they have their academies. So yeah. what's the point for them to have a 19 and 18 years old from another club knowing this player is not going to stay there? There's Coaches, no one from Australia that's going to be better than the academy kids I have. It's so, just not. No, nah, but you, 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 the thing is that you do have, a, the lucky thing here, or I would say, at 17 years old, you can start playing in A-League. Yeah. So you have that professional level experience. I mean, yes. professional experience. So you can go there and be good enough to play. You're not going to be consistent and it's going to take a bit of time to adapt. Seriously, like, I don't know, to be honest, how many players went to Europe and Cousini Yangi is probably one of them. I'm thinking about him who went straight away from here to England and did, did well straight away. I like, love speaks him. the language and all that stuff. So I was actually, for him, I was perfect and he's doing incre incredibly well. Uh, but then it takes time. The language, if you don't speak the language, you, all of a sudden you live with your parents, 18 years old, you got to go live somewhere, you don't speak the language, different culture, and they don't respect you. They do not respect you. So that's the hardest thing. But my thing, I'm, to me personally, I like young players going to, I would say, a club where... A young, uh, like a smaller club where you're not going to get game time. Pick the right league because sometimes people say, people say, oh, it's Europe. Okay, but there's a way to see Europe. There's the fi top five leagues. Then you've got countries like Belgium, Portugal, Switzerland, Holland, everything. They're great countries, but you need to pick the right team. And you know, Scotland, for example, if they want you, Celtic, for example, like obviously... Tillier. Ma yeah, yeah, he went there, didn't play. I, I saw him, I can say it because I, t I told him personally I, when I saw him a couple of weeks ago, he should have stayed there. My thing for me is like, if you make that decision, Celtic is a big club. Definitely a big club. Huge. Um, the league, okay, how can I say it? It's a massive club, but it's not, it's not Real Madrid. In terms of clubs, the size of the club is huge. Yes. It's amazing. Like, it's seriously, it's crazy. But the team, the quality of the team is, has nothing to do with, like, you know, the top, top level. It's a big fish in a small pond because but, the rest but, of the Scottish league. But for league. me, he should have stayed. I would have stayed there, tried yeah. to make it work at least for one year. That's me, my opinion. And if it doesn't work, I would have tried to stay in Europe. But that's me. Then, obviously, players, everyone is different. Sometimes, you know, if you're not happy and you want to come back, whatever, that's a different philosophy. But mm. go to a smaller club where you can stay, and if it doesn't work, keep working hard or whatever. For me, it's about that. Keep working, as I said earlier. Don't give up. So I've got two things. First thing, what did you think about Nestor Aaron Kunda going to Bayern Munich? <sighs> I don't, it's hard because, as I said, put yourself in, your, in his position. It's hard to refuse yes. when you have a club of that size coming to you and probably giving him a good contract, everything. Probably. Yep. And then you look at it and you say, okay, if it doesn't work, you can go somewhere. Yeah. Now me, it's like, okay, I look at that and I said, I had one of my players, I had the Bayern Munich a year and a half ago. Didn't pick the Bayern pick because for me, that was clear it's too big. I gave my opinion on that. I was like, it's actually just too big. Um, only future will tell you, like, if he made the right decision or not, if, he, if he's made the right decision. So if he goes there and starts playing, and you're going to start training with Harry Kane and those players, everything, but now you look at the competition and you say, okay, where? Where can, where can you play? Well, that's the thing. So it's sometimes people, I'm, I'm not a massive fan of those moves. Like, going from Australia, if someone thinks he can go from Australia to Man City, Real Madrid, and Barcelona and play, you're wrong. Of course. I can, I can tell you straight away. Yeah. 
There's no players, and a lot of people every time that try to bring up the names of Harry Kuehl, Viduka, man, that had amazing career. They were top players. One in a million. And like, but you look at players like Tim Cahill and everything, they went to Europe. They made it work. They stayed, they worked hard. They didn't sign to the best club in the world, yep. but they had an amazing career. Amazing career, And a lot of them, like Bresh, uh, Bresciano, everything, so they played in Europe. They had amazing career, uh, and playing. also very different mentalities than young. Yeah, players but but days, the thing is, like is they a, went there a whole and they stayed thing. to make it work. So now we just look, look the new this generation. Like now, football is like as soon as you play a couple of games, a lot of clubs come and look at you and everything. And sometimes clubs just want to sign you because you're a young player. They don't do a lot of research. They just look. Oh, he's 15 years old, 16 years old. Man, let's try to sign him. But you need to go for me somewhere where you know you're going to have a... At least I have a plan. Then, as I said, I can't play for you. <laughs> no one can play for you. Like, you're going to be the one on the pitch. So if you can't make it work, man, it's, at the end, it's, it's you. But if the club comes up with the right plan, that's what we want to do. Look at the, our club, for example, they play a lot of young players. You need to look at it as well like that. Like, how many young players play? Do the club, for example, if they do trading, that's what they call it now in Europe, yeah. A lot of clubs want to sign very young players to give them game time for two or three years and sell them to make a lot of money. That's what a, Chelsea that, does. That's yeah. one of the. That's one of the club. Which club? Oh, Chelsea. Uh, no, uh, Chelsea don't do that. They spend hundred million. They don't do training. I was gonna. No, but <laughs> I mean, I mean, what we do is especially with our academy players, is <laughs> we try to sell them off, and it's mm. it's a whole thing that's been annoying me lately. Like, that's off topic, but so. You leave football and you become a football agent. Now, let's just break this down very simply. For those who don't know, what does a day in the life look like for a football agent? <laughs> I'll tell you, bro. He's Barack Obama. <laughs> I, can't, I, I cannot get him on the phone. He doesn't reply to any of my text That's messages. Bullshit. <laughs> That's bullshit. Bro, how long did it take you to get you on the phone to say, hey, can we do the podcast? Yeah, uh, because he called. Nah, because he called me last week, but I was going to Sydney, coming back, had to go back to Sydney. So, unfortunately, I had one of my player. He snapped his Achilles. So, yeah, I right had to go. Yeah. I had to go. <laughs> far out, bro. I, I had to. I had to go there with him, like for the surgery, yeah, yeah, spend fun. time with him. Like it's just f normal things you have to do. Like yeah. because f I don't have. I'm not interested. First of all, to have fifty or sixty players to look after because for me it's impossible. The way if you want to do the right thing, you, you need to see the players, you need to go see them, w watch the game, spend a bit of time with them, whatever. Sometimes you just go for lunch with some players, like just to to see them. Yeah. You have to travel, whatever. Then you have to work with clubs in Europe, overseas or whatever, get in, get in touch with them. The, there's a lot of things. Like obviously it's one thing to look after the player. Yeah, but in the same time, you need to work, I would say in advance, talk to clubs, uh, spend a lot of time with clubs to make sure they know the players, you send them things, they follow the players. Look, obviously if the player does really well and he's doing well, it, it's much easier. Mm. But then I always tell men, some players sometimes, look, my thing is, if you don't do, and I always tell the same advice, my agent, I had the same agent for my whole career. I had whatever, 18 years, the same agent, never signed any contract with him. I was just like, he's like a big brother to me. And now I work with his brother, whatever, we work together. But he, the first time we met, it was like, if you do well, you don't need an agent. I mean, you will make my job much easier and you're going to need me when you struggle. Yeah. That's what he said. And I say the same thing to players. If you do really well, you're going to make my job much easier and I can do things. If you're rubbish in A-League, why am I going to take you? Which players are you looking after right now? Uh, or well, what deals did you get done? So, foreigners coming into the league, I brought Tolgai, Aslan. Yes. Valer Jamin, Damien Da Silva, Marcelo, Schne wow. Schneiderlin, Berisha. Uh, fuck, I'm going to forget. <laughs> I'm gonna, wow, yeah, that's some, already a some, very some good. Some of those players, yeah. Uh, then my thing is to focus on young Aussie players. Yeah. So, it's to... I will say I've got Mohamed Touré, Cusini, Yangi, Rafael Borges, Bernardo Oliveira, Moussa Touré, uh, his brother Alassane, who's in France. So, yeah, it's uh, Ramina Jarin. Like, I'm trying to focus on, I've got others like Michael Roos and everything, trying to focus on young players that can help 
to take him overseas. And some players, for example, ex to bring experienced players into the league, but to do well. Obviously, when I see what they're doing, like a uh, tall guy for me is arguably the best player in the league. Yeah, then exactly. Valère Germain is doing amazingly well with MacArthur, Marcelo and Damien Da Silva are not even a question the two best centre-backs in the whole league yep. uh, last year Valon Berisha came did really well so there's players like coming and so it helps because I want to help the league to get better so to bring just to do a deal and bring a player and if the guy okay then it's football sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't work but at least I know I've done my research I spoke with them I know they're going to have they're going to come with an amazing mentality and they're definitely going to help to make it better. And the young players is to give them advices, to help them, obviously, because it's a long journey, but it's to explain to them what it takes to become a soccer player, everything, help them to make a move, for example, if it's within A-League, but if you start changing changing three, three clubs in A-League, it's not a good sign. So, yeah, sure. But because they're young, it, sometimes you're in the wrong club or not the it doesn't suit you. you got to go somewhere where you play. And I said, if you're young and you play and you do well here, then I can help you. Like, there's no doubt I can help you. If you had, let's just say, obviously you say you want to keep your list quite small, right? So that you can do, do things properly with the amount of players that yeah. you have. If a player was exceptionally good, but he was a dickhead, would you, would you take him on? Uh, it's hard. Like, what it's do hard. you look no, for in players? No, so the, so. the thing for me mentally, is, it's a main thing. Like, it has to be, you can be young, make mistakes or whatever, but if you have a good heart and you're a good person, and you know, you you are young or whatever, like, you know, it's the same, like everyone makes mistakes. So if you're a good person, for me, that's probably the main thing. Be before we talk about the quality of the player, if you're a dickhead, I will say no. Nah. If you're a dickhead, I will say, I, I want to work with you. Yeah, because you I, end I, up being a carer. Because, because, because one of the things for me is like, when I go to a club, if it's in Europe, in France, in England or whatever, and I talk to them, I can't lie to people. I, I cannot lie to people. So I'm not going to sell them some because I have to vouch for you. And I put my reputation and my credibility there. So if I say to a club, look, this one is good, and he ends up there and he's a dickhead and he's rubbish. It's on you. It's on me. And yeah. you know what? The club will never work with me. But I can't lie. I have too much respect for the football, for myself. And I can't do this. And then if it doesn't work, man, sometimes you go to a club and say, look, man, he's, look at the potential. He's really good. I like him. He's got an amazing attitude. He's going to work hard, everything. Try then you can do that. And there's no promises, but because obviously the guy is going to go there, try to make it work. There is a, a difference of level between countries, but clubs are aware of it, so they're willing to take the risk. That's for me, it's fine. And that's how I try to do it. And sometimes I, when I really believe in players, look, there's a couple of players now, but I've got Rafa Borges in MacArthur. I really believe in him in terms of attitude, in terms of work ethic, his, his quality, everything. I think he's someone like to be honest, like when I go to and talk to a club, I definitely believe in what I say. Like I don't say it, whatever. I say, man, this kid is he's got amazing quality, blah, blah, the potential. Is he gonna be amazing in Europe? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. But that I can I can guarantee and I can vouch for that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. If you're a dickhead, it makes it hard for me to go in the terror club because how many players are so good in Europe? Mm -hmm. They have that. And if you're a dickhead, what's what's the point for them? Because you bring someone from Australia. It, uh, it it's there's a lot obviously like you know what to going there like different countries culture if you're dick and man they're not interested so for me i would say like yeah it's a meant he has to be a good player and have that potential as a no, young Aussie. but yeah it has to I be think, it has to be a good person i think you must be <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay i think you would be really proud of cassini um yeah because Although Portsmouth are in League One, they're probably going to go up and they're still a massive club and he's doing so well and he's making a great name for himself. He's now a Socceroo. Is that the most proud moment of your agent no. career? It's, it's definitely... You know when you... Obviously now I'm an agent, but for me, I look at them more like as younger brother. Yeah. You know, they're for me like younger brother. Like Mohamed Touré is in France. Sometimes he's got injuries, sometimes this and that. But, you know, when you talk to them, like, it's maybe not every day, but every two or three days, you talk to players, everything, to make sure, like, sometimes it's hard, but you say, look, it's part of it. The struggling, you're going to struggle. That's yeah. fine. You need to you need to warn them. When they went to France, him and Yaya Dukuli went to France 
Alassane Touré joined them now, everything. It's going to be much harder. You're going to struggle. That's for like, like almost 100% sure. If someone tells you oh, it's going to be great, no, not at the yeah. beginning, man. Yeah. And Kuz, when he obviously, he, whatever, he made a decision, Portsmouth, everything, the presentation. He had also clubs in France. He had a club, but Trois wanted him, everything. Mm. And then we spoke, the presentation of the club was amazing. And the way they wanted him, they showed that interest. And then you look at everything. How many games do they play? Coming from Australia, Kuz, regardless how good you are and your attitude, it's going to take maybe a bit of time, but you need to adapt. Because you play 26 games, you're going to play 60 games. You can't play 60 games after just playing 26 games. You're going to get injured and everything. So you're gonna, it's gonna be, you're going to be on the bench, you're going to play everything. So you need to know that. Yeah. And the club was great with that. So now, obviously, you want to play more everything, so it's going to take time. But the thing for, me, for him, as I told him, the sky is the limit. Because his attitude is amazing. Hopefully, they do get promoted and in a, they're in a good way to get promoted. Next year, it will be, he will be in championship. Hopefully, he's a starting 11 player in championship. And if he keeps working and his attitude, everything, maybe, hopefully, like you know, it's a Premier League. Yeah, but as I said, it's step by step. And sometimes it goes, it goes quick. But you need to tell them and the young players, when you go to Europe, and I can't say it now, there's a young player going to France at the end of the season, but I've been arguing with him, or not arguing, smashing him, take French courses and this and that, because I know how hard it is to learn a language. And you need to do that. It's about respect. So when you go there, you need to exp like show them everything. You need to show them like you've done the right thing. You respect the club, you respect the culture, you respect the country, and it makes it's gonna make it so easier for you when you get there. So you need to explain to them everything. Some of the players, like you know, a couple of players we've been talking now with a couple of clubs. Okay, there's a few clubs here. What's the best thing? And you have to go through everything. I think this one will be good. I think this one, maybe it's better. Maybe it's a better club. Maybe you're gonna make more money here, but don't think about the money. Don't think about it. It's about game time and all that stuff. If you, if you just think about money now, it's, it makes no sense. So what you've just described is a good agent, you would say, is not only doing the deals and stuff, but an actual mentor and someone yeah. that they can, like you said, they're like younger brothers to you. Yeah. Do you think a good agent has to be like that or should they just say, I'll just deal with the business you do uh, the point. Everyone is different. Okay. I don't know, to be honest, like, look, there's agents, world-class agents in the world. I have no, it's, I don't know, to be honest. For me, what I, the way I look at it, I had my agent my whole life. He's like a big brother to me. Yeah. I didn't call him every month yeah. I said, because I didn't need that. Yeah. I actually didn't need to talk to him every month or whatever. So yeah, every now and then you speak to him, like how it is. But I wasn't like, you know, there's players sometimes that ask for more. And there's players sometimes, you know what, if you don't call them, they don't need that. Yeah. So everyone is very different. Obviously, you talk. I played, which makes it easier for me, like, you know, when we speak about football. But everyone is different. Like, as Bernardo Oliveira snapped his Achilles two weeks ago, or two and a half weeks ago. It's, it's, he's one of the kids where he left Adelaide to go to MacArthur. He's doing really well. He's a kid. I've, I've been working with him for more than two years. Like, I, I'm very close to him. Look, so when it happened, like... Mm. He, it it affected me. Of course, more, yeah. I don't. I didn't care about the injury. It's more about like the mental thing about for the player. Like the, I know how much he loves football. His family is amazing. Everything. So straight away, like you know, you go to Sydney, you spend a bit of time with him, surgery, and then there's other things you have to deal with. Try just try to help him. So everyone is different. I'm not saying there is a good or, or bad agent. To be honest, I, I don't. I, I will never criticize someone else. That's fine, bro. Um, yeah, bro. If you, let, you, you tell us, yeah. No, no, no. All good. Yeah, That's yeah. why my daughter is uh, sorting everything out. So That's good. Okay. Um, so it's I, I will never criticize someone else. Every agents, there's people doing that for 10, 15 years, or whatever. That's my way to do things. Be like coaches, right? Different styles. Exactly. Different styles. And and to be honest, <clears throat> the only thing what I will say is like the way I do my things, I cannot have fifty players. Yeah. I'm not interested because. I can see how much work I spend and I do on between 15 and 20 players, to be honest. Like, you know, to having those players to manage everything, the travel, so uh, 
I'm going to see so Portsmouth hopefully to get promoted around the tenth. So I'm gonna leave here to go to England. That would be awesome. Wow. Uh spend that just a week or ten days there in England, everything also to catch up with clubs. Coming back here, going back to France a couple of weeks later to catch up with clubs, take one of the players, sort everything out for one of the players here. Coming back here, stay two weeks, going back to America, going to America. <laughs> so it's but it's all it asks a lot of us because I'm also going to clubs to talk with them, having those direct contacts because I have partners. I, I work with a lot of people, everything. Sometimes people are better than me in certain countries. Yeah. And I'm, I don't have any arrogance or something to say, oh man, I'm so good. No. Nah. If someone is much better than me, I'll just ring him, say, look, man, I've got this player. Can you help me? Whatever. And if this agent is better than me, I will do the deal. And I don't care about how much money I'm going to make or whatever because for me, it's just about the players. I really don't care about my, I have no pride. To be honest, like, I don't care. I'm here. To, I know what I've done, everything. And I do, I do that to help young players and players to come into the country to have the same experience as me and to help the league to get better. But I, I'm not going to say, like, hey, it's my business, but I know what I do and when I'm doing it. Well, uh, that's a good point you make because a lot of agents, especially in this day and age, you get those super agents. I don't know too many agents, but I know like Mino Rayola and, and a lot of these guys that look after the big boys and they almost seem like they're superstars themselves sometimes, these agents. But it's it's refreshing to hear that you just want what's best for the player. And Yeah, but you look at... You, well, Rayola now passed away, but yeah. the way his players spoke about him is amazing. Yeah. Because you, Pogba, Ibrahimovic, they, look, they looked up to him or like they talk about him like as a father yeah. for some of them. So it means the guy also was doing the right thing. And I know an agent who is actually a big agent and amazing person. The guy tells his players, I'm not here to be your friend. I'm here to make you money. And he's right. <laughs> but to be honest, there's nothing wrong. Yeah, no, he's actually no. spot on. The guy is actually... And he tells the players, what I need is you at the end of your career have enough money to live and be happy. I don't care about... I'm not here to, make you fr to become friends with you, whatever. So that's a way to do things. I'll tell my players... I want to I want to be with you from the beginning until the end of your career. Yeah. Same thing I've done with my agent, but also to make sure like there is a journey, there is a path, and hopefully at the end of your career you have enough money or you've made enough or whatever. So at one point you're gonna have to make decision based on maybe money or a certain move to help you to s set up your life. But at the moment, especially when you're young, don't think about money. Money will come if you're good. Yeah. That, that yeah. I can guarantee that. And seriously, if you sign in one of the top league, everything, it will come. The first thing is about game time, development, which club you're going to pick, and money will come. So it's more about it. But you try to help them through everything. So I've got two more questions on the, on the agent side of things. This is really interesting. The first one is, um, have you come across agents or the way deals have been done and thought, that's disgusting. I would never... Yeah. You, so you come across that how I've often? I've done, I stopped, I stopped. I didn't want to do one deal in Korea last year when I called I called an agent. I didn't have the player, so a, cl a club called me for one specific player here, Austra Australia. Yeah. I knew exactly who was his agent, so I didn't want to talk to the player directly because I think it's disrespectful. Yeah. Uh, for me, like if someone has got an agent, I will call the agent, I will try to make it. And that agent, actually, when I gave him the amount, he was like straight away, oh, we'll take that and we split it. And I was like, no, nah, it's actually disgusting. No, nah, that's money for like, okay, you take a bit of money, it's normal because you get paid, but of course. the money is mainly for the player. And at one point, especially if you don't do anything, you shouldn't take that money. And he was like, no, nah, it's fine, whatever, he would be happy for less, everything. I said, uh, I, I can't do this shit. I don't want so it. So he stop. wanted too much, basically. He wanted too much, and I didn't want to because actually the money was supposed to go to the player. So I didn't want to do it. Then this player looks as agent. Now, to be honest, look, a, a lot of agents, even here in Australia, with me, the, I would say there is respect yeah. because probably they see me also as a former player. And the way I do think, I called one of the agents last time, a club from Europe called me for one player here, another pa a player. I just found out who was his agent. I just called the agent directly. I said, look, I'll put you in touch with the club straight away. I could have done it myself and, like, you know, be involved. I, I didn't want to. Do agents do that? Do they, do they get a call and steal? Me, 
No, uh, look, probably some of them, yes. Okay. Uh, some of them definitely try to, even yeah. with some of my players. That pisses me off. Oh. <laughs> no, nah, because the thing is like, and, and it did happen <laughs> to someone, actually someone who I knew, he knew I was a player's agent, and he, despite that, he tried to call the agent, the player, tried to call the player to see with him, like, you know, if he was interested. But the good thing is, like, that player straight away sent me the text message, <laughs> told yeah, me, yeah. and I called the guy yeah. and I smashed him. And I was like, okay, that, if you're that kind of person, forget my number, don't ring me, don't, even tr don't ever try to work with me because it means you're a dickhead. You ruined it the means, relationship. No, but it means you're a dickhead. And I, we work for the players. For me, it's if, and uh, if I have a club from France, from Italy, from Spain, calling me for one player in Australia, I always check if he's got an agent and I call the agent. And if I, even if I know the player directly, I will call the agent first and I will try to make it work with him or whatever. Sometimes I don't even want to be involved because sometimes you have too much work. You're here to help the players. So Because I will do the same thing. I will help someone to call me. This morning, It's talk about it. And Rafa Borges, to be honest, like I'll say, texting me one of the guy in England, like an agent, whatever, sent him a text message. It's an, he didn't know whatever. Like The agent actually knew me. The agent didn't know he was with me. So I texted him, whatever, and straight away the player sent me that to, I think it's a lot of respect as well. Of it shows me I can trust him, everything, so you know that's the kind of thing. That's what I want to build. And I always tell my players, if someone calls me and has got something for you, I'm happy to work with him. I don't care. Like, I'm not here, seriously, to make money or like, uh, yeah, obviously, we all have a business. Yeah, of course. But yeah. th for me, the main thing is to make sure you make deals happen, you, you, you pick the right club for the players, and you're here to help them. What about, have you heard of agents hiding deals from players and not telling them about certain offers and stuff like that? Oh, I remember hearing yeah. stories like this. Yeah, well, you, you probably have some club, I don't know, to be honest, like, you, you probably, if you have agents very good with one club, the problem is like sometimes you, I would say you have probably agents who they don't want to upset clubs. I don't know. I've I've never seen it. People sometimes they say one thing or whatever. I don't know. To be honest about, does it happen? I don't know. For me, it's like you have to be honest with everyone. You're gonna make clubs upset sometimes because yeah. if they all want the same players, at one point you gotta say, look, I'm gonna give my opinion to every players. When I speak to my player, he knows what I think and he knows which clubs I will pick. But at the end, the decision comes to him. Like, you know, he's the one making decisions, especially when they're young. I always said, speak to the family. But sometimes, like, I know there's one or two players. I convinced them to pick that club. And I was like, mm. you should go there. Mm. Yeah, trust me, if you do go there, I know you're going to play. And I know after, I can definitely help you. You need game time, and then I can help you. And fortunately, until today... It went pretty well for so some of the players. So, but yeah. Can I just ask you? Sorry, but no, I've got, I know that I've got parents that would want this answer. What? How should parents behave with agents? What would you say to parents? <laughs> Stay away. I know. <laughs> Stay away. <laughs> uh, it's it's com it's com it's complicated because I'm a father, but I also put myself. My my daughter, she loves musical acting and all that stuff, and. For example, last time we spoke with an agent, whatever. I didn't even get involved, whatever, obviously. And that's he's an agent. So the guy is talking everything. I don't know the world of acting. So, you know, I don't want to be involved. Yeah. And you can talk, whatever. So I always tell people sometimes, say, oh, it's not because you watch football. It means you know something about football. And I bought my house. doesn't mean I know anything about real estate or something. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's always the same thing. People sometimes they want to get involved, say, oh, this and that. Stay away. Like just, I will always, one of the things with me and that's the only thing I can guarantee, I will do my, the best I can to look after the kid. Always. I will do everything I can to help him to have a successful career. If he struggles, I will go through the struggle with him. That's for 100% sure. But then stay away because the problem is like you're getting, when you get emotional, it doesn't work. Sometimes you have to be, if you don't play for three or four games, sometimes you have parents getting pissed. Like, you know, why he's not playing here and that? Yeah. What you, are, you, are you at training? Do you watch him train? I don't know. Sometimes, like, you know, let's make works. Like, you have to stay calm sometimes. What do you feel about family members being agents for their... I look, if you look at Mbappe, that's a great thing. <laughs> eh? <laughs> I think, look, if... Sometimes it's some of them want because there is money. Yeah. 
look in Australia there's not nothing crazy but there is also a bit of money but mm. they all look at it like oh if he goes to Europe everything man you know what it, until he goes to like a certain level hey sometimes there's no money I tell sometimes to my players like hey, you guys cost me money no <laughs> <a> trouble, <laughs> everything. Yeah, some of them nah but it, but it's because sometimes people or I'm not gonna say some of them are greedy yeah. but some of them are <clears throat> want to protect their kids but if you don't know anything, like, first of all, you need the contacts. Before we talk about anything, you That's need the number contacts. One. Yeah. Well, first of all, you need the players to play well. Yeah. So uh, the player has to, be, has to be good. But then you need the contacts. And then it's about, like, sometimes knowing things. Like, you know, when you negotiate a contract, there's things you can ask in a contract, things you cannot ask, or things like, depending on which clubs, sometimes they can do things, sometimes they can't. You go to England, different rules to France. Like, the way they do their contract is different. You go to France, it's different to Portugal. You go to Africa, it's totally different. You go to Middle East, it's different. So you need to have people with you helping you and lawyers and everything to help you to do that. So people sometimes say that they just want to have them, oh yeah, I'm going to look after him. Because, and you do have agents that have no contacts and what they expect is the kid to do really well and they expect people to call them. Yeah, yeah. And now uh, I want this one, I want this one. Yeah, but you have to go through me. Okay, fine, that's fine. For me, I don't care because when a club calls me for someone else, I'll ring the agent directly. I don't try. If someone's got an agent, I don't even try to work with him. This sound, like this world, I could not work in straight oh, out. No, bro. I've no you, it sounds like you have to have thick skin. Yeah. And I'm just picturing like Fahid and his player going to a club, meeting with this exec and this mm. owner and blah, blah. And I'm just like, and these people would play hardball. Yeah, but it's, it's look. It's also depending on which players you have, yeah. and you know expectation. But sometimes it's also depending on the clubs. As I said, money. Look, when you have certain players, everything. Yeah, of course you negotiate a certain contract, and yeah. like it's it's different. But if the club respect you, usually like you know they always do the right thing. It's more when you have young players. <laughs> clubs clubs want to take advantage of some players, like you know young players. You know, or sometimes. In A-League here, for example, there's not a lot of money. So everyone wants to have Messi with no money. So it makes it hard. You know, everyone <laughs> wants Mbappe, but we don't have the money. Yeah. But it's just like some clubs sometimes when they have a young players, I want to take advantage, signing him. Uh, it's fine. Don't sign any contract. Like, you know, you, you're not in a, in a rush. But also he's been training to be an agent since for a long time, man. He negotiated Las Vegas <laughs> for us after we won the A-League. That's so the biggest deal you've ever done. That's the biggest deal <laughs> he's ever done. Las Vegas after winning <laughs> the A League. That that's a whole another podcast. Yeah, that's a whole. That's whole. That's, no. But that's why, yeah. So it's it. Look, it's great. My thing for me, what I enjoy is like actually when I take a, a young player to another club, especially if it's Europe. When you make that move, like you know, there's a step obviously, and you go to Europe. That's great because yeah. you okay. You that's a first step. I would say the first big step. Or someone moving from, from A-League to another club and doing really well. And when you look at him and he's getting, he's getting there, it makes me happy. But I know it takes such a long time. Yeah. And to, there's no rush. You know, it's, uh, as I said, there's no rush to make it work. It takes time. If you do the right thing, I tell young players, look, we'll be fine. Like, you know, it's just being patient, working hard. Like, you know, sometimes when it's hard, just keep working. 